start, and uh, I, this isn't strictly speaking an outline, but it's a number of points that I wanted to cover in the sheet that I handed out when we talk about what is the Word of God, at least in the Lutheran understanding of it. Now, you'll find that varies somewhat from church to church. Is there an echo? Am I uh, coming through okay? Okay. Um, and that's why I wanted to address the subject, because in some other churches, uh, it might mean something different. But uh, this is from a Lutheran perspective, and I would say it's pretty generally true throughout the, the major denominations uh, of the church. So with that, I'll begin. And as always, uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions, make comments, that's fine. Uh, I kind of enjoy that sort of give and take because I'm not always sure that uh, I'm coming through unless uh, people ask questions or make comments. So that would be fun. Where we, where we should begin, I think, is with a biblical understanding of what the word, word, means. Because it's not as we think. Words for us are not even a dime a dozen, you know, they're almost worthless because we hear them all the time between radio and television and all the other gimmicks that we have. Uh, just we have constantly assaulted by words. But in uh, the scriptures, uh, in both Hebrew and Greek, Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek, uh, word meant something much more significant, and I got the words there, dabar in Hebrew and logos in Greek. And, and that understanding, a word was something dynamic, living, vital, uh, not superfluous at all. Uh, and it, it, uh, it had a... Uh, living meaning. It was almost as if a word was alive. And we see this in this verse I quoted here, Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word, this is the Lord talking, be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. So you, you can tell from the way that's uh, Phrase that God's word is something dynamic, something living, something that's going to accomplish what God intends. So that, that's where we need to begin with our attempt to understand what we mean by this phrase, the word of God. Now, underlying the sense of God's word there is another whole conception which is very important, and that's revelation. How do we know anything about God? Uh, we can't see God, we can't touch God, we can't hear God talk to us, uh, we can't feel God. Um, how do we know anything about God? We can hardly even imagine God without some prior knowledge of who God is. So the whole uh, basis for this phrase, the Word of God, begins with this realization that it depends on God's self-revelation. So revelation, that's not a word we hear very often, but it's really key to knowing anything about God, and certainly knowing anything about what God's Word is. God reveals God's own self. Now, I may use the pronoun he when I talk about God today, but please understand, when we talk about God, there's no gender involved. Uh, God is unique. God is God. So he, she, um, neither one applies accurately, but we don't have a better, we certainly don't want to say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> in English, we're kind of stuck. And so I may say he for God, but you'll understand. So God has revealed himself. That is 
one of the foundations of our faith. That we aren't just kind of imagining and guessing and wondering, but we have something to go on. That is God's self-revelation. Now, basically, that is the Word of God, but we'll, we'll get to that more specifically. Um, as I point out here, um, oh, I, I meant to say that revelation is a basic concept not only for Christians, but also for Jews and Muslims who, who base their faith on the fact that God has spoken and acted and therefore we know something about God as against wondering and guessing. So it's not only a Christian concept of revelation, but it's very much uh, a concept of the three religions of the book, they're sometimes called, you know, meaning scripture. Or uh, not only what we call the Bible, but also the Quran as far as uh, Muslims are concerned. Well, okay. Um, now, so God uh, wants to reveal God's own self to us and what he intended in creation, what he intended for our human life. However, given the limited human understanding as compared to the totality of God, um, Sometimes in this revelation process, human beings got it right, sometimes they got it wrong. And it, it, so it's a mixed bag, if you will, uh, as we try to understand God. And um, so ultimately, uh, God, I guess, in God's own self said, got to do something better than this. So God chose to take on human nature and try to communicate, to reveal himself as fully as possible within humanity. Something we know, something we can understand. Uh, so that's what it's all leading up to. Um, but it, uh, I guess, you know, again, I'm summarizing here when I quote Galatians 4, 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. The fullness of time. Presumably that means, uh, in Paul's mind when he wrote this, that over a long period of time, God was preparing for this ultimate self-revelation uh, in human form. And so the term means the time had finally come when God was ready to do this. And so Jesus was born. Well, we need to go back, now that we've gotten that far, <laughs> and say that um, there was a long period of preparation for this ultimate self-revelation of God in the birth of Jesus. And that's basically what we read about in the Old Testament. But um, the way God began to prepare for what presumably was in God's mind from the beginning was to choose a people. Um, you know, God wanted to reveal his plan and uh, how to do that? Who's going to understand it? Who's going to uh, spread the word? Who's going to try to live it out? It requires a chosen people who hopefully would understand and respond and obey. So God chose the Israelites. That's, that's the whole uh, beginning of the story. Um, happened, of course, again, through two people, uh, Abraham and Sarah, to, to start with. But it wasn't just that they were to be two special people, but they were to be the 
progenitors, if you will, of this chosen people, Israel. So the revelation then uh, comes through uh, two people, then more people, and finally a whole people, the people of Israel. Um, and they're to be God's messengers. First to understand what God was doing in revealing himself and his intentions for human life and the world. And then share it with others, be the, the ones who carry it out in their speech and in their behavior. And once again, uh, as I suggested a few minutes ago, they got part of it right and they got part of it wrong. Um, and so in the Old Testament, as the, which we'll get to in a minute, as a record of what they were trying to assimilate and understand and proclaim, um, looking back, we have to say uh, certain aspects of the Old Testament are very right on target, but other ones are kind of questionable, um, like some of the slaughtering of people and uh, the rigid rules about what to eat, what not to eat, um, or stoning to death someone who, a woman especially, caught in adultery, uh, you know, <laughs> did God really mean those things? So, um, the record of God's self-revelation, uh, as we get it in the Old Testament, is, uh, I would say, right on and not so right on. Well, how do we get the Old Testament? A part of God's plan was not only to have these people, chosen Israelites, uh, to show God's intention, but to get a record of what God was trying to get across for future generations. And so part of it was the selection of people to write uh, a record of what was happening and what God was revealing. Here's where uh, a lot of Christians differ in terms of what that was all about. Uh, there are those who say uh, God dictated the very words that were to be written down. That's not our understanding in the Lutheran Church. Um, as we know, uh, human <coughs> perception and acceptance and living out of God's will is uh, a mixed bag. Sometimes we manage it and sometimes we really muff it. So it has always been in human history, a mix of accuracy and mistaken ideas. And so in the writing of the Old Testament, God's Spirit was certainly active, but as I indicated with the, uh, the whole people of Israel, sometimes they got it right and sometimes they misunderstood and misinterpreted. And again, uh, you know, I kind of illustrated that. Uh, it would be the same thing when they uh, interpreted God's will as being the slaughter of people or um, behavior toward women. Uh, their personal and cultural ideas and ideologies uh, colored what got written. Now, uh, sometimes this revelation from God uh, came clearly through individuals, we can think of some of the main ones, Moses and Isaiah and other prophets. Um, sometimes it came through events. Uh, not only did God's word come through Moses, and he, by the way, was quite puzzled uh, about all that. Um, 
But through the whole experience of liberation from Egypt and uh, guidance through the wilderness and being led into a promised land, I mean, it wasn't only um, someone speaking and leading, but it was the whole experience that the people of Israel had. And of course, that um, exodus, as it became known, was looked back upon, still is, in uh, Jewish history as almost the epitome of God's uh, self-revealing as one who is just and caring and loving and guiding. Um, so it was both uh, revelation that came through individuals, but also through events, major events. Um, when in later history of the Israelites, uh, they disobeyed uh, God, and rather than trusting God, they went off uh, and worshiped the gods of some of the tribes around them, or they set up military alliances with other nations that was not part of God's intention. They were disciplined. Things didn't go well for them. Things, and at least this is how they interpreted their history. <laughs> when things went badly, it was a word from God that they did something wrong. They had not been faithful. Well, these are the kinds of things then that got written down and put into what we know as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, only rarely, probably, were the actual writings by the people we know of, uh, like Moses. You know, the first five books of the Bible are often called the books of Moses. Uh, Moses didn't write those books. Uh, others wrote about Moses probably quite some time afterward because of the oral <laughs> tradition. The, the prophets, which make up a large section of the Old Testament, uh, were probably not written down by those specific prophets. Uh, in fact, if you take the, the book of Isaiah, which sounds like it's all one person, it's actually three different uh, writings covering a span of a long period of time. The, most of these writings in the Old Testament were by people who um, observed what happened or reflected upon what had happened and so it was not only the leaders like Moses and the prophets and so on, it was also those who were involved in trying to interpret those events for, for the ongoing history. Uh, and, and obviously it had to be people who were literate and uh, in those days most people were not. Uh, they had a great oral tradition, but the scribes were the ones that were trained in writing things down. So. What I'm trying to get across is that it, it is a very complex and kind of mixed bag when we talk about God's revelation that comes to us through Scripture. Now, so far I've just talked about the Old Testament. Some of these things could also be said about the New Testament. But um, just, just to get us going on the idea of revelation and how it comes to us, through a people, through individuals, through those who wrote about the individuals and the events. It's all uh, that uh, mix of things. Um, yes, sir, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, can you contrast that view with how um, like Roman Catholics view the Word of God? We frequently have members joining the church who come from a Catholic background, they say 50% of the time. And how does our view of the Word of God, as you just explained it, how does that compare with what they're used to hearing in their upbringing? Can I go a little further before yes. I answer that? Because as as it's a good question, yes. but I think <laughs> some of the other things that I want to say will right. help get us into that. Um, so I've said that uh, part of God's plan is to have these things written about, uh, what we can say is that the writers of Scripture were the interpreters of God's revelation. 
four dots. Now, all of that brings us to what I call the main event. It was, it was all preparatory in our understanding of what God was doing in the world and in revealing God's own self and hopes and plans for us humans. And by us, I don't mean just us Lutherans or us Christians, I mean everyone. So, in, in the fullness of time, as uh, St. Paul wrote it, uh, it came the time for um, God's self-disclosure in the way that seemed most appropriate for us humans to assimilate it, to understand it, to be able to relate to God and what God uh, is and is doing in this world. And that was the coming of Jesus, the Christ. This term Christ is Greek, and it's the same as Messiah in Hebrew, meaning the anointed one, that is, specially chosen and appointed by God. Um, that was a common understanding that kings and emperors were anointed because they were chosen to be leaders, or self-chosen <laughs> sometimes. Um, but that's what the term Christ means. God was sending his own personal representative. In. Now, here we have to uh, say, we don't know how God be, could become human, but it is not beyond the realm of possibility that God who created everything and who is capable of everything could uh, <coughs> enter into this life as one of us uh, to show in terms of an actual example and by teaching what God's will is. Now all of these things I've talked about are God's word to us because all of this is part of God's self-revelation to help us humans know uh, what God is, who God is for us, and what God hopes and intends for the whole creation. And so um, everything in the Old Testament is leading up to what the New Testament tells us, and the New Testament, of course, focuses almost exclusively on the life and teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus. So, um, that is the Word of God, and we'll unpack that a little further, but I want to read um, from John 1, these are familiar words, but uh, just to refresh your memory, I thought I had it marked here, but I didn't. As, as the Gospel of John begins, this is how it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And then a little further on, uh, and the word became flesh, and lived among us. So that summarizes in some ways uh, what this phrase, the Word of God, is all about. Now, uh, to get to the question that Sue raises, um, I don't think there's much difference between what the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church would teach on this subject. Uh, there was a time when 
the, the Catholic Church was kind of uh, indifferent, as probably is a fair word, to teaching much to, of, about the Bible to individuals except through proclamation by priests. Uh, that's changed considerably in the last uh, three quarters of a century. Uh, some of the leading biblical scholars in the world today are Roman Catholics, and uh, so there's been much more emphasis upon reading and studying uh, the Bible in the Catholic Church. Now, um, I thought you were going to ask a different question, which was uh, the difference between Lutherans and some other Protestants. Well, I was thinking that too, and um, you know when you drive by a church that says we preach the God of the Bible, or the word, you know, from the Bible, and, yeah. I, and I guess okay. that can vary by church. Please you turn that. over your sheet of paper, and you will see uh, something called confession of faith. Now, this comes from the uh, model constitution of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, our church, and it is not only recommended, it is uh, mandated that any congregation that wants to belong to the ELCA should, in its constitution, contain this declaration of faith. So uh, this is very carefully thought out, uh, as you'll see when we go through it. Um, and it's um, maybe somewhat more Lutheran than Roman Catholic, although I, I don't think there's much here that Catholics would disagree with. Um, seems to me it's uh, been the universal understanding uh, from the beginning, and then gradually uh, uh, got changed by some. But let's, let's take it from the beginning here, and again, uh, stop me at any point to ask questions, and uh, let me respond. So, C201, this congregation confesses the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. This congregation confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and the gospel as the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Let's take a minute to talk about that word gospel. What's that mean? It's, it's uh, capitalized here. It's, uh, that's okay. It surprised me a little. But in the, uh, in the New Testament, uh, the equivalent of the English translation gospel really means good news. Uh, and essentially good news from God. So when we talk about the gospel, in our church, we're really talking about God's self-revelation in Jesus. That's the really good news from God that enlightens us more than any other way about the nature of God and God's relationship to us and hopes for us. Um, so that's, that's unpacking the word gospel. All right, then uh, number 11. A, Jesus Christ is the Word of God incarnate in the flesh, through whom everything was made, and through whose life, death, and resurrection God fashions a new creation. Um, you can see the similarity from that confession and John 1, uh, through whom everything was made. Uh, that's straight out of the Gospel of John. Then, B, the proclamation of God's message to us as both law and gospel, we can talk about that in a minute, is the word of God, revealing <coughs> judgment and mercy through word and deed, beginning with the word in creation, continuing in the history of Israel, and centering in all its fullness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That, in summary form, was pretty much what I've been trying to say this morning, uh, that it's the Word of God is all of that. Now, um, 
The canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the written word of God, inspired by God's Spirit, speaking through their authors. They record and announce God's revelation centering in Jesus Christ. Through them, God's Spirit speaks to us to create and sustain Christian faith and fellowship for service in the world. So, um, here we get to the, the primacy of Jesus as the Word of God. Uh, all of God's revelation centers in Jesus. Everything else follows from that. So when uh, we Lutherans talk about the Word of God, primarily we're talking about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and all that that means. And everything else is secondary to that. Now, that's an important distinction to make. See, I think Roman Catholics would say exactly the same thing. But uh, many Protestants, often we call them fundamentalists, uh, sometimes the word evangelical is used, but that's kind of an inaccuracy, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, would change the primacy and, and make it the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. And you've certainly heard that even in Lutheran circles. <laughs> but strictly speaking, at least in our branch of the Lutheran Church, the primacy of the Word of God is Jesus the Christ. Secondarily, the Scriptures are also the Word of God because they testify to Jesus and God's whole revelation throughout uh, the Bible. Um, look at, uh, let's see, Number 13 here, the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the written word of God, inspired by God's Spirit, speaking through their authors, they record and announce God's revelation centering in Jesus Christ. Through them, God's Spirit speaks to us to create and sustain Christian faith and fellowship for service in the world. So, scriptures are very important to us, but they're not the primary word of God, and number 14 kind of carries that out. This congregation accepts the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testament as the inspired word of God and the authoritative source and norm of its proclamation, faith, and life. Now there we might have a little difference with the Roman Catholics. Um, you don't hear anything there about the importance of tradition in, in understanding the Word of God. Roman Catholic Church would probably place, if not an equal weight on tradition with Scripture, they would put it right behind Scripture so that um, the, the um, various proclamations of Rome through the centuries are held up on a par, or nearly on a par, with Scripture. That we, we would disagree on. As you might recall, um, that's where Luther hung his testimony. Uh, if I can be convinced by the Word of God that I've made a mistake, I will recant and by the Word of God in meant Scripture. Uh, otherwise, I, I will not recant. Um, now, we, it's not that we don't pay any attention to tradition, because if you look at number 15 and 16, they're interesting, not as important as the first parts, but 15, this congregation accepts the Apostles' Nicene and Athanasian creeds as true declarations of the faith of this congregation. Well, that's an important part of church tradition, because in the first few centuries, uh, of the post-Christ era, <clears throat> uh, the, the church was growing and branching out all over the Mediterranean world and beyond, and, and there were 
you know, communication wasn't what it is today, so there were groups saying, this is real Christianity, and over here someone saying, no, this is real Christianity, and over here someone no, this is real Christianity. So, uh, you know, they tried to bring that together, and um, these creeds uh, were the result, uh, saying, okay, in as brief a form as possible, these are the basics of our faith. Now, personally, <laughs> um, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, I think, are entirely different than the Athanasian Creed, if you're familiar with that one. There are parts of the Athanasian Creed that I personally, as a present-day Christian, do not want to affirm because it not only affirms some of the basics of the first two creeds, and incidentally, the, the, uh, the timing of these creeds is, as they're mentioned, the Apostles' Creed really was never determined by any authority of the church. It kind of uh, came into being as a statement of faith in the early church uh, and gradually was accepted by most of the congregations spread around the Mediterranean world. And that's why it's called the Apostles' Creed, because while this seems to be a summary of what the Apostles taught, and it was never a, a church council or authority that approved. The Nicene Creed has that name because uh, in the fourth century, a council of the church meeting in Nicaea uh, adopted this wording as a somewhat expanded but true statement of the essentials of the Christian faith. There are some things left out, incidentally, but that, <laughs> what's in there is, is pretty basic. But then um, there was a lot of controversy and there were groups that didn't fully agree. They were called heretics, which in our day, I hope we can get away from because uh, it, it's so easy to draw the line, you know, this is orthodox, that's heretical. Um, well, as we know throughout the history, people have gotten somewhat right and somewhat wrong. And uh, just because you may have somewhat wrong doesn't mean you're, you're out. But the Athanasian Creed says you are because there's a section of it which just says that those that don't agree are not only out of the church, but condemned to hell. Uh, I mean, it's, it's bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, I said this at one previous uh, uh, adult forum, and Carl Lund, who most of you know, said, well, you're not an Orthodox Lutheran then. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> if that's what it means to be Orthodox. Uh, so, even within the Lutheran uh, branch of the church, we're going to find variations. And, and, uh, and I, as a pastor of the church, uh, will disagree on some things with other pastors. So that's as long as we understand that the word of God is Jesus Christ and our, uh, our faith and, and everything uh, connected with it is bound up in loyalty to Jesus Christ. That's the central point. Um, now I, I, I've been going on here for quite a while. Have, have I dealt with your question okay? So, any other comments or questions? The, the, yes. the, the term here, uh, inspired, Inspired by God's Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and that seems like that term inspired kind of gets to the notion of, um, you know, it's mostly right. Or, or uh, it's, it's, it may not be 100% accurate. Yeah. Whereas it, it seems like, boy, I can even remember my very Lutheran grandfather, you know, almost talking about the infallible, um, you know, value of the, of the, yeah. the Bible. And, right. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, is this notion of being inspired, how long does that go back in the Lutheran tradition? Well, certainly to Luther, um, and I guess in the Lutheran tradition you can't go back any further than that. Uh, uh, but, but you, you know, you speak to the nub of the issue, uh, 
the word uh, infallible is not there, and it's not there purposely. Because within our branch of the Lutheran Church, we accept the fact that the Bible is written by inspired people, but they're not infallible. And God did not dictate through some kind of pipeline the words of the Bible, or even necessarily all of the ideas of the Bible. But uh, God certainly was present and guiding the process by which the Bible became known as the Bible. And, and it's a very complex process, of course, uh, written over hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, what we have in some of the books today is not exactly what the original writers probably wrote, but it's been edited and edited and edited until it's in the present form. Um, so that, you know, which ones were infallible, the original writers or, or the editors? Uh, we don't use that word infallible. We, we believe that God is present in the writing and that we are able to learn about the Word of God from Scripture, certainly. Both the preparation for Jesus and the whole uh, ball of wax concerning the revelation in Jesus. So, you, you hit the nub of the situation, yes. So are there some denominations, Christian denominations, that would lean more towards using the term infallible in yes, their belief? definitely. Mm -hmm. Even some Lutherans. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly the Wisconsin and it uh, does. Missouri Synod is... Their documents say inerrant. Yeah, it's inerrant. The documents of the Missouri Synod say inerrant. inerrant. Yeah. So if you were to compare these kind of constitutions to one another, yeah. there, that would be the main difference. Yeah. However, um, within the Missouri Synod, uh, some congregations uh, are less inclined to accept that than others. Uh, whereas in the Wisconsin Synod, my experience, it's pretty universal. Yes, uh, uh, for, for me, um, a student of history, all the iterations and all the conferences that took place to determine what should go into the scriptures and what shouldn't, what struck me is when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and they started reading some of the things, started translating some of the things, and the remarkable sameness that we have in some of the prophets today <coughs> that strikes me as remarkable all these iterations that some of this was not lost in time. Yeah. Um, or even greatly altered. And yeah. greatly altered, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, a lot of the other stuff, uh, these these were people that, that separated themselves from the rest of the what they call the corrupt world, and they wanted to live the, the, the right life that they saw in, in what they had mm -hmm. gotten in the scrolls and, you know, their, their daily life, the bathing, the eating. Uh, a lot of that is not what we refer to as gospel, but what they had written down, what the prophets had said, and some of the other writings from the Old Testament, just remarkable how uh, what we have today was not lost in time, a lot of what we have today. Um, I was Wisconsin, and they are very literal. Um, when I, I talked to the one pastor, oh yeah, seven, exactly seven days. Not seven periods of time that it took for God to create the world or the universe for that matter, or, or how he did it. You know, that's left up to um, scientists. But even Einstein said that what he discovered, he said there must be a God. He said he can't imagine all of this without a creator. Yeah, right, right. Yes, so how does this address um, continuing or future revelation? Okay. Um, very important aspect of New Testament, but you find it in the Old Testament too, is uh, Jesus saying, uh, I will be taken away, but I will send you the Holy Spirit. And the whole concept of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God is God's continuing presence with us, inspiring, um, also uh, sometimes uh, the opposite uh, when we don't get it right. Uh, but the, our 
belief would be that God is present with us. And even, uh, in one place Jesus says, uh, someone remarked uh, how wonderful it was what he was teaching. He said, uh, you will learn greater things than this. Uh, and presumably, he was referring to the fact God's continuing presence in the Holy Spirit inspires and guides and leads and also reprimands us in an, in an ongoing history and in our daily lives, individually and collectively. Now, from the beginning, uh, I stress that God chose a people. Uh, to carry out his uh, plans. And I think that's important to know that God didn't just go with one individual. Surely there were outstanding leaders. But the main emphasis was on the people Israel. And we too are a community of faith. And so what we need is the sharing of our understanding of revelation of God's word to correct and help and guide and, and renew one another. And uh, you know that's what church is all about. Uh, so God continues, we believe, to guide us through the church. Go ahead. <clears throat> and that also leaves open, if I understand correctly, the, the canon of Scripture as we know it is, you know, it feels historically closed. But my sense is there's, it's still open. So let's say, you know, we're digging into sand in the Middle East and we find a new piece of Scripture that we can <laughs> prove has authority and, and inspiration, all these categories. My guess is that that among Christians, at least, and, and if not in other places, you know, that that one of the pieces from those early councils was that the canon wasn't necessarily closed forever, um, lest something new be found. Well, um, if we think of the Bible and the scriptures as being a interpretation or a revelation to people to write down as they see it, that continues to now that we read it because we read it with the uh, looking for Christ and with the Holy Spirit to help us. So that there's many interpretations, so we really have to study it and look to each other and find out what interpretation they have because we're all desiring to find out the will of God and the revelation of God in the scriptures which are, have been gone over by others before or was created to begin with, with a revelation, with a uh, interpretation. So the interpretation just goes on. Can we ordain her? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, that's very well said. Uh, that Please know he said it was well said. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't approve of it. Uh, but that's why we study the scripture, and that's why we do it in groups. Uh, I mean, you can read it alone, too. But sometimes when you read it alone, you scratch your head and say, what in the world does this mean? <laughs> uh, so it, it helps to get the insight of other Christians. Yes. What's the difference with uh, evangelicals? How is oh. their faith? Yeah, I, I never did get back to that today. Uh, again, uh, the word evangelical comes from a Greek word which means good news. And again, it's about Christ. Uh, it's used in the New Testament. Um, and so, the term as it's used in American society is not reliable <laughs> because it, it covers a whole range of things, some of which are evangelical and some are not. We belong to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, uh, but we mean something different by it than the press usually means when they talk about the evangelicals. What we mean is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is central for us and therefore it's the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, the way the press and often the public uses the term is uh, to as almost isolate a certain segment of the Protestant Church which is uh, more literalistic than we want to be. So it depends who you're talking to how that word is used. Does that help? Yeah. More like 
Yeah, uh, in some circles it would be equivalent to fundamentalism, right? What but about that, Baptist? How does that reflect? I'm Baptist? sorry, what? Matter of Baptist? What is that? The Baptist? Baptists. Really. Oh, Baptists vary a lot. <laughs> in fact, they're proud of the fact that uh, uh, by and large, congregations in the Baptist church are uh, somewhat free. The Southern Baptist Church, which is the largest one, is uh, pretty fundamentalistic and literalistic. But there's another branch, uh, much smaller, called the American Baptist Church, and it's, these uh, separations date to the issue of slavery, by the way. Uh, the uh, American Baptist Church is more in the north, and it's much less uh, fundamentalistic than the Southern Baptists. Uh, and you would find varying degrees of uh, interpretation going from one congregation to another. And then there are a lot of independent Baptists, and uh, I hesitate to say what they believe. <laughs> Except that you've got to be baptized as an adult. That's, that's uh, kind of uh, the primary. Yeah, they stem from the Anabaptists, yeah. which believe that because Jesus was baptized in the Jordan as an adult, that all should understand what their baptism means when they're being baptized. Yeah. Do the Baptists require you to be rebaptized as an adult if you believe in the uh, I think mm -hmm. most Baptists would, but again, I'm not positive that that would be true of all Baptists. Probably not true. Uh, in the Northern Baptist, or what do they call them, the American Baptist Church. So, yes, Tom. Then you've got the Mormons who, when you join the Mormon Church, the reason that they do all of this, going back, and they baptize everybody they can find in the history of your family posthumously. Yeah. Which, yep. you know, mystifies me. I, I talk to people. They're genuinely nice people. Yeah. I mean, they're very polite. They're, you know, they they are very happy to discuss scripture with you, but their thoughts on the gospel are very different than ours. They are. You're right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you mind to um, talk about the fact that it's both law and gospel? Oh, I, yeah. I did refer to that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. uh, the word of God as law and gospel. When I was uh, early in my presentation talking about um, the history of Israel and uh, God often encouraged but often reprimanded them and uh, punished them, uh, basically that's what we mean by law and gospel. The, the gospel is God's good news of encouragement, of love, of grace, of wanting all human beings to do well and, and live well. Law, and incidentally, law and gospel has become a stronger emphasis in the Lutheran Church than most others. Uh, the law is referring to the fact that God also has given us commandments and things based on the Ten Commandments, which explicate them better, uh, which if we don't pay attention to, uh, we are likely to suffer for. Now. Uh, that gets into a whole um, way of interpreting the Old Testament because in parts of the Old Testament it, it was a firm belief, and you could tell from the way the writers wrote, a firm belief that those who were rich and well off and uh, satisfied with life had been uh, good people, they had pleased God, they had done what God had commanded, whereas those who were poor and struggling and miserable, they had done something wrong and it was their fault and therefore God was punishing them. Um, the, the, um, that's questioned in, in the Old Testament, but that is probably the prevailing view. And it was probably still the prevailing view at the time of Jesus because if you recall, there's one incident there where, uh, was it a man born blind? The disciples asked Jesus, is it because he sinned or his parents sinned? And Jesus said neither. Uh, and he didn't explain that very well, 
but accompanied the other questionings in Scripture. In the Lutheran Church, we would say, uh, yeah, we do suffer when we uh, violate God's intentions for our life most of the time, not always. You know, it's a, it's a murky kind of thing. Because some people who live pretty uh, nasty lives get away with a lot. Um, but by and large, um, if we live life as God intends it, it will be a more satisfying and worthwhile life. Uh, even if you suffer for many things, like sickness or other things. Uh, it's not because God is punishing you. It's because this is a mixed up fallen world and there are things happening in human history that are not directly attributable to God. Now here's where the mystery and the questioning comes. You know, why are there tornadoes? Why are there tsunamis? Uh, why is there snowfall on Sunday morning, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, some of this we just can't answer. But by and large, uh, God's Word contains both warning and, uh, and word of, of love and goodness. Uh, the warning is Life is created in such a way that you'll do better if you live within these parameters. Um, and the law is you violate them too much, you will suffer. And the gospel is no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you and will redeem you if you give him a chance. So I think that's as clear as I can make it. Anything else? Thank you for being the faithful remnant. <laughs> <laughs>